Well, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. We should have a few more people wandering in yet. Uh, we got a couple people that can't be here today, and so we will miss them, but I'm glad all of you are here. Um, so uh, you may remember last time we talked about how do you know? So how do we know God is real? How do we know the Bible is God's word? Um, we talked about that kind of stuff. Then we talked about, well, who is this God that is real and created everything? And we kind of said the triune God and how do we know God is this three but one God? We know from Holy Scripture. So if you will, you can turn to page 19 on your handout, that less than three. But then once you got that open, just grab your Bible and turn to uh, 1611 in the large print, um, which is Luke 15, starting at verse 11 in the, um, if you don't have a large print one. Good to have you join us today, too. <laughs> so Luke 15, verse 11. So as we study the scripture, there are two primary messages that we find there. I forgot I'm supposed to stay lined up. <laughs> um, and both of them will be illustrated in this story. This is a familiar story. I'm pretty sure all of you know it. Uh, we're still going to just glance at it for a little bit. So uh, Luke 15, starting at verse 11, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Um, one, just so you know, firstborn son back then got two thirds of the estate. Secondborn son got one third of the estate. This is secondborn. Um, thirdborn son, <laughs> There's nothing left, so, <laughs> yeah, tough being three, four, five. Uh, honorable yeah, honorable mention, yeah. Um, so, um, but why is this really a horrible thing? When the kid went to his dad, imagine him being in his early 20s or something like that and saying, Dad, I, I want my share of the estate right now. What's, what's bad about that? <laughs> One, it's not his. You know, no one is due an inheritance, right? That's, that's not something that's yours. That's something that may be yours, but it's... Uh, but what is he saying to his dad when he says, I want, I want my share? He cares more about the share than him. Yeah, he cares more about money than he does his dad. You know... Um, and what this is, this is total disrespect to the father. He's saying, I don't want to wait for you to die. Just give me my share of the stuff now. I'm out of here. I mean, this, this is rude. I mean, it really is disrespectful, um, especially in that culture. In today's world, eh, I guess we might even expect that these days. But uh, back then, this was totally disrespectful. Um, but the father divided his property between them, so he gave him his share of the estate. For whatever reason, the father did what he asked. Not long after that, the younger son, like not long after that, I think that's within a few days. I think he, he was out of there as soon as he got the money, more or less. Um, the younger son got together all he had, set out for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. Um, easy come, easy go is a saying that we use in regard to money. Um, this is going to be true for him. He got a lot of money. Um, but it seemed to disappear even faster than he got it. Um, after he'd spent everything, everything. Um, by the way, uh, what percentage of lottery winners declare bankruptcy? It, it's higher than that, but it's, it's an amazing thing. You know, if you win, I don't know, $20 million, you'd think uh, you've got it made. Um, but in reality, you outspend what you got if that's the type of heart you have. It doesn't matter how much you have, you can always outspend it. And that's what people do, you know. Um, certainly true here. So after he'd spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. And I want you to imagine, imagine it didn't rain for oh, two, three, four months in a row. What's going to happen to the crops? You're not going to have any. You know, whatever plants you have to begin with are going to wither up and die. There will be no harvest. And, and you have some stuff stored up from the last harvest, but it runs out about the time 
the next harvest is supposed to be there. So this is a time of severe hardship. And there weren't that many merchants. There wasn't a lot of the service industry jobs. Most people took care of their family by means of agriculture. So this is a, is a real problem. So he went out and hired himself to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. Now, for a Jewish guy, pigs are unclean animals. Um, you're not allowed to eat them, but just hanging around with them is kind of against the code. So um, this is kind of like a slap in the face to him, but that's all he could find. And he had to have something coming in because he, he had squandered his great wealth. So he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating. Now, what kind of stuff do you give to the pigs? Yeah, so I remember Gladys got, um, two years ago, the potatoes that were rotten. You know, it's not potatoes we wanted, that Gladys got. That's what, Gladys was a pig. <laughs> you know, I'm, yeah. um, and so if he's thinking, gee, that looks good, that tells you about how hungry he is. I mean, this is a bad situation. But no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, what a beautiful statement that is, when he thought about what he had done. You know, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. Now, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. That was true. When he got his inheritance, he, he was no longer the father's son. And he's, he knows it. And you know, now he can see how horrible that was, what he did to his dad. Um, and he doesn't go back saying, uh, please reinstate me as your son. He go, goes back and says, can I work in your fields? I, I can't live in the house, but can I live in the, I'm thinking of Bonanza, the bunkhouse or, you know, whatever. Um, you know, um, this guy has been humbled. He's um, a different person. By the way, have you ever rehearsed what you're going to say to someone? If there's something that's really heartfelt that you know you need to say, maybe an apology or something, sometimes in your mind you keep saying it over and over again until it's pretty much set. That's what this young man was doing all the way home. Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So, um, but while he was still a long way off, this is my favorite part of this story, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. While he was a dot on the horizon, his dad saw him. Now, what does that tell you about the dad? He, yeah, he was looking for him. And also, he had good eyesight. <laughs> you know, but, you know, he was looking for him. And I can just imagine that all day long, every day, the father's looking out in the direction his son had left, just hoping to get a glimpse of him coming home. That's amazing. Um, and so then when he saw his son, he ran to him. And, and I have to tell you, um, for Jewish men, running was undignified, you, you know. Jogging was not a thing back then, and only, only poor people and people in trouble with the law would run, you know. Um, rich people did not run. That was undignified. But he ran to his son. Um, there is no dignity more important than his son. And um, he threw his arms around him, and he kissed him. By the way, I think when uh, you go to heaven... The father's going to come running to you because he's seen you coming. And he's going to throw his arms around you, dry the tears from your eyes, welcome you home. I, I could see him giving a big kiss right on the forehead too, you know. <laughs> I do that to my daughter most nights. I still got to give her my kiss on the forehead. Um, the son said to the father, and look at this is word for word what he was practicing. Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And he never got out the last part, make me like one of your hired men, because the dad interrupted. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. 
Now, in this story, we see the two themes that you find again and again throughout Scripture. One is the sinfulness of humanity. Boy, that's in there. The, the, the son who doesn't want to stay with the father, wants to go off on his own and do things his own way and squanders and wild living, all that. That's us. That's the sinfulness of humanity. But then the other thing that you see throughout Holy Scripture is grace. God's grace. Because there's this amazing, surprising... We would expect the Father to stop right there and then at least give him a lecture, you know? One of those dad talks. I'm, I was famous for it. My kids kind of hated the dad talks. You know I'm disappointed in you, son. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you've never got one of those talks, have you? No, because you're, you're such a nice young man. You never got anything like that, did you? <laughs> no comment. Bridget, I know you've never got anything. <laughs> Remember, you're in church, too. <laughs> yes. Um, so, but we have this grace, this forgiveness. It's interesting. Somewhere, if you want an interesting read, read through the book of Judges. Book of Judges, um, God's being good to Israel. They turn their back on him and start worshiping other gods from the countries around them. And then God sends another country to invade them, to bring them to repentance. And eventually, after maybe 20 or 40 years, they'll finally repent and turn back to God. And then God would send a judge or um, a, a leader to set them free from their occupation. And they would be good for 20 to 40 years. And then it'd start all over again. It's the same cycle. We keep messing up, and God keeps forgiving us and giving us another chance. That's what the scriptures show. Now, in your handout, it talks about there's, that's kind of considered... Um, the two main themes are law and gospel. That's the, the Lutheran terms we like to use. Um, and notice the law tells us what God wants us to do and not do and what kind of people God wants us to be. So you can think of the Ten Commandments. That's law portion of Scripture. You know, and that makes sense. The law portion of Scripture shows us the reality of our lives. Because... You know, the Pharisee's attitude, oh Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. Um, that is my theme song, but it's in jest. I don't mean it, you know. <laughs> um, it's so easy to slip into that mindset. And the law shatters it. The law shows us our reality. It's like when I get up in the morning, and beards are funny, by the way, when you sleep, you probably get this too. When you sleep on whatever side it is, your beard goes the opposite way. Tamp, you get this too, right? You know. And if you don't comb it, you know, you rush out of the house, and my hair looks awful, and I, my skin still gets greasy. I still get pimples. But I look in the mirror in the morning, and it's like ah, you know, <laughs> you know how. And there's not making that good. You can make it better, but you can't make it good. And so when the mirror shows me who I really am, and even though I like to think of myself as uh, you know. A, uh, uh, the next big uh, macho man Hollywood star with the charm and good looks. Who would, uh, Tom Cruise is not tall enough. I don't want to be. <laughs> you know. But somebody like that, anyway. So um, the law shows us as we really are, not as we want to pretend. It shows us a reality. Um, and we need the law. You know, why am I eating healthy and eating spinach and cucumbers every day now. For 10, 11 days, I've eaten cucumbers and spinach every day. Why? Because the law worked. Uh, my doctor told me I needed to do something because I was pre-diabetic, borderline diabetic, and so the scared me. You know. That's, the law has its purpose, which is to make us take our situation seriously and get the help we need. And the gospel tells us about the help we need. The gospel, I think of law SOS. This is how I, when I was in sixth or seventh grade confirmation class, my uh, MYA, Minister of Youth and Education, today it would be known as a DCE, um, taught us uh, SOS for law shows our sin, for gospel shows our savior. So the law is about what we're supposed to do. The gospel is entirely about what God has done. 
It's, it, we don't do anything under gospel. It's all done for us, but it's all about Jesus and how the stuff we can't do and failed to do, and um, he's done. You know, so the gospel shares good news. Let's look at Romans 3, which is 1733, 1733, in the large print ones again. Romans 3 otherwise. And, and I think we'll start at verse 9. Uh, so Romans 3, verse 9 on 1733. Um, what shall we conclude then? Are we any better? Not at all. We've already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are under sin. Um, we're under the system of sin. We sin, we got the punishment coming. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways, and the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now, what would you say? Is that a law portion? or a gospel portion. That's all law, because it's pointing out our sinfulness. That's a law section. And, and now we're going to keep reading. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. That's still law, right? Therefore no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law we become conscious of sin. So sin's purpose is to show us our reality. Our, the Ten Commandments' purpose is to show us our reality. But now look at the next part. But now a righteousness from God, apart from law, has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. So there's a righteousness that we have not earned comes from God. Now this is the start of a gospel section. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference for all of sin, that's kind of a law statement there, and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. And that's all gospel. And, and I just want to show you, you know, there's some portions that are more history telling of events that are not law and gospel, but whenever you read the books, you'll see statements of law and statements of gospel. And they're both necessary so that we realize why we need Jesus, why he's so important to us. Because the easiest thing is to start fooling yourself and start you know, trusting in yourself. And quite honestly, that's especially for church-going Christians. So easy to start thinking, well, God is pr uh, proud of me and approves of me because I go to church every Sunday. And you know, most people don't do that anymore. And I, and I give faithfully and I serve and I, you know, and those are all good things to do. Don't get me wrong. But that's not why God's smiling at you. He's smiling at you because of grace, because of forgiveness, because of Jesus. Um, you know, the law is not going to get us God's approval. The law brings us condemnation. It's Christ that brings us uh, peace. Yeah. All right, uh, go to the next page. So um, and we kind of talked about this last time. How do we know the Bible is true? You know, how do we know Jesus is real? Is there any proof? Um, there's evidence that supports all the stuff we believe, quite honestly. Um, so what would be evidence that the Bible really is the Word of God? Uh, fulfilled prophecies. Yeah, because uh, like just about Jesus, there are, and there are different people have different amounts, but over 300 specific prophecies about Jesus that were perfectly fulfilled in his birth, life, death, and resurrection. Over 300. And the odds of all those predictions made hundreds of years before he came about coming true are pretty much zero percent. Remember Gene Dixon? Some of you know who that is. Who's Gene Dixon? Yeah, psychic. Every year at the, usually in mid-December, she'd come out with her 
predictions for the new year. And usually she'd have like, I don't know, 12, 15 predictions about what was going to happen next year. Um, so everybody, you know, it made newspapers all across the country. I don't, I don't know if she's still alive, but I don't see her stuff anymore. But uh, what percentage of her predictions, just one year out, not hundreds of years out, but one year out, how many came true? No. And there never was a year she got more than 20% right. Now I'm going to tell you, I could make a few predictions about 2022 and get a couple of them right. I could predict President Biden's popularity is going to continue to decline. Now that does not make me a psychic. <laughs> you know, um, it's just, you know, so, um, but the fact that 100% of those prophecies, those promises were fulfilled, well, that says the person who wrote the Old Testament made sure they were fulfilled in the New Testament. There's a mathematician, Hoyle was his last name, H-O-Y-L-E, uh, and he, he was, probability and odds was his specialty. And so he once, uh, I think he took 10 of the promises about Jesus, 10 specific promises, like um, they would gamble for his clothes and stuff like that. Um, and he just did 10. And what were the odds that all 10 of those would be fulfilled just as described? And he said it's about the same as covering the state of Texas. How many have been in Texas? All right. How big is Texas? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's not as big as Alaska, don't get me wrong. <laughs> you know, you've got to put Texas in its place. But that's the second biggest state, and it's huge. It's huge. So cover uh, Texas with, um, let's say, Morgan silver dollars, because I, I always wanted to start collecting those, but they cost too much per coin, so I, I don't. Uh, but they're covered with Morgan silver dollars, one foot deep. Now, already this is a fun thing, because it's like, i got to go visit Texas. <laughs> you know? But uh, and only one of them is marked with an X, with a permanent marker. So um, let's say Kim Tripp. I'm not picking on your husband today, because, you know. Um, he was on time. Yes, he was. Oh, yay. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm picking on you instead, yeah. Let that be a lesson for you. <laughs> um, but let's say you were blindfolded and spun around 18 times, and then you could wander the state of Texas for as long as you want, and eventually, though, you had to bound, bend down and pick up one of those silver dollars. What are the odds that you pick up the one that has the X on it? Yeah, it's, it's really, in, in a statistical form, it's zero. Now, you know, once you get beyond, what is it they say, 1 to the 10 to the 18th power, um, anything less than that is, is odds are zero. It's never going to happen. And that's what he said. He said that this couldn't happen unless God made the promises and God made sure they were fulfilled. Now, quite honestly, there's another answer to how do we know the Scripture is God's Word, and, and that's by changed lives. You know, I told you my story that it's when I started taking... Uh, the Bible seriously and spent regular time in it every day and group Bible study classes and worship, um, my whole life changed in one year because I, I was actually reading God's Word and things happened in me. Um, you know, I never heard a voice of God saying, hey, go to the seminary, be a pastor. But I knew that's what God wanted me to do. The Lamborghini became just a distant part of my memories. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, so, um, the, that is, you know, um, and now, all right, one, let's say, uh, the other thing I'm supposed to point out is um, the Holy Spirit uses the law of God to show us why we need Jesus, to show us our sin and why we need Jesus. And the Holy Spirit uses the gospel to give us hope. Here's the solution. Here's the answer to our need. Here's the problem. Uh, a solution to our problem. Um, yeah, then um, look at uh, under the church teaches, they have Luther's explanation to the first part of, this small, uh, of the second, third article. I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength, I've got to say it the way I memorized it, believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him, but the Holy Spirit has called me through the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts and sanctified and kept me in the true faith. When we hear the promises of God in the Bible and believe them, that's because the Holy Spirit was at work. He, he, he gets the credit. It's not that we rationally figure out the keys to eternal life on our own. It's that the Holy Spirit gives us that, that understanding. All right, so then overview of the Bible. 
39 Old Testament books, mainly written in Hebrew before the coming of Christ. Um, there's a little bit that was written in Aramaic, just a tiny bit. Um, and then 27 New Testament books written in Greek after the coming of Christ. Um, so pastors today have to study Hebrew and Greek um, so that they can not just take the interpreter's words, but can go back to the original and make sure they're teaching faithfully. Uh, when I went through the seminary, we did not have to take Hebrew, and so I didn't because languages weren't my expertise. And I always kind of wish that I had because, you know, I've got books that are written by people that they take every word in the, in the Old Testament and show you where it comes from, what it means, the different possible definitions. So I've got resources that can make up for it, but it's a lot harder work the way I have to do it. You know? All right, and then in the Old Testament, we've got mainly the first part is history books. Uh, so they have Genesis through Esther. It's telling um, the history of mankind, especially the history of God's chosen people, Israel. Um, why is Israel so important in the Old Testament? Because that's where the Savior was coming through. It's not really about Israel. It's about through the Savior who is coming through Israel. You know, as a descendant of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and David and, and Solomon. Um, so it is history. And when you read it, you know, some of it's a, a little tougher. Uh, numbers has a lot of numbers. <laughs> a little tougher. There's good stuff in there if you kind of wade through it. But uh, like Book of Genesis has all the stories that we love and easy to get excited about. Um, but history. Then you have poetry. And it, it's interesting. Turn to, uh, yeah, let's look at Job. Um, say, say go to 824, page 824, um, which is Job 40, and then, so keep that, and then go to like uh, Genesis, somewhere in Genesis, I don't even care where. Now, in the Genesis, so you got this and this, okay? So in Genesis, um, everything's kind of standard paragraph form, right? You know, you, this is story, narrative, and it follows our construction. Then you go to Job. Is it in standard paragraph form? Why not? It's poetry, Hebrew poetry. So Job, Book of Psalms, Proverbs, those are forms of Hebrew poetry. And, you know, you can think of how a hymn you have, if you're writing the words of a hymn, you know, you do that differently than if you're writing a paragraph. It's, it's, it's different. So um, Hebrew poetry did not have to rhyme. You know, it didn't have to have the same rhythm, same number of syllables. It had a different format, um, several different formats, actually. But I, I just want you to see, so these, these books, uh, Job through Song of Solomon, those are different because they, they have some history in it, but it's mainly poetry that teaches. Um, so what is Job all about, for example? Job guy had a great life, everything going his way, and then boom, lost almost everything. And then got painful, painful boils that covered his body. And you can kind of think of, if any of you know someone who had severe case of shingles, those nerve endings that are, are raw and just filled with pain, that's kind of what he was going through. And, you know, his attitude was what? The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. God has given me good things. Can I take bad things from him too? You know, what a breath of fresh air. And that's what he was until his friends came <laughs> and brought him down. And then all of a sudden he's angry at God because God was being unfair. And then God answers. That answer of God is powerful because God said, where were you when I made stuff? Like and if you... Um, you know, when I made the Leviathan, a dinosaur. You know, when I made the behemoth, where were you? Did you, did you, were you there? Were you there when I uh, contained the oceans in their place? Were you there when I made the continents? Were you there? You know, who are you to question me? You know, and God never answers Job's complaint. God said, who are you to even ask me a question? 
And Job repented. And God loved him. And Job was restored. But fascinating book. That's actually the oldest book in the Bible. Right. So who wrote the first five books of the Bible? Yeah, Moses, the Pentateuch. Um, and um, fascinating stuff. Okay, then you also have prophets. So what is an Old Testament prophet? What, what did a prophet do? Yeah, so we mainly think of a prophet as someone who tells the future. And that was in a small part of what they did. But mainly they were preachers who preached law and gospel. Law, condemning people for their sin. Gospel, telling people about the forgiveness of God that would be seen in the Savior who's coming. Um, you can think of Isaiah. Man, he pulls no, uh, has no limits when he, he condemns sin. But he also, he talks more about the coming Savior than probably anyone else in the Old Testament. You know, so they were mainly preachers. Now, the difference between them and a preacher today, so I get what I'm supposed to say through this. Isaiah got it directly from God. You know, and I'm in awe of people that had that kind of connection to God that God gave them the words um, to say and made sure they were written down too, by the way. So um, prophets, we have four major prophets and uh, like 12 minor prophets. I'm, I'm going to memory now. Um, what's the difference between a major prophet and a minor prophet? The major ones were better paid, had more prestige. <laughs> no. Um, there is no difference, not in anything, except the minor prophets were shorter. <laughs> major prophets went on and on and on. So... Um, you know, you know, a pastor who preaches 30 minutes every Sunday would be a major prophet, and those that preach 12 would be a minor prophet, <laughs> I guess. Um, okay, and then in the New Testament, you got history. And Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that's the history of Jesus Christ during his days on this earth. Doesn't tell us everything about Jesus, because they couldn't. They, they're limited. On a scroll, you can only be so long. So they told us the main things about Jesus. And mainly, they skip over almost everything in his life, after he was born till he was 30 years old. I mean, so, um, but it's all about Jesus, about what he did on earth, about his death, about his resurrection and uh, his ascension. Um, but the book of Acts is also a history book. It's the history of the early church after Jesus' ascension into heaven. And it's a fascinating book. By the way, was the church pretty well perfect back then? No, they had squabbles and... Uh, I write people at voters assemblies and all kinds of stuff. Kind of sounds like the church of today, actually, you know, and, and that's who we are. Um, and then you have epistles. Uh, we don't use that word anymore. It used to be a standard part of the English language. What is an epistle? A letter. So, uh, you know, here's my epistle that I'm writing to you. Um, that like in the days of Jefferson, that would be some of the language they might use. Um, so these are letters that were written primarily by Paul, but also sometimes by other um, apostles. Um, so Peter and James and John wrote, you know, Peter had two, John had three, plus the Gospel of John, plus the book of Revelation. Um, so he had five. Um, you know, uh, John, yeah, and then James had one. Who is James, by the way? Yeah, Jesus is half brother, um, and he was he became a leader of the church in Jerusalem. Even though early on, did he believe in his brother as the Messiah? No. <laughs> I find that fascinating. And all the people that doubted him even after he rose from the dead, and the, unless I see him, they became the leaders. They became the ones. Um, so we got epistles, and then the last book is back to a prophecy book. Um, the book of Revelation is uh, really misunderstood. Um, people are scared of it sometimes because sometimes you can get bogged down in little details and miss the point. That is a fantastic book of hope if you don't worry about every little detail. Sometimes uh, uh, Jack Van Impey, did any of you ever used to watch him on TV? I don't know if he's still on. Uh, Jack Van Impey was a fascinating uh, television preacher. But man, when he wrote the, talked about the book of Revelation, he had um, the locusts were um, attack helicopters coming into the Middle East from Russia. You know, and oh man, he has it all uh, spelled out and it sounds so convincing. 
Because when a man of God says that, it's got to be true, right? It's on TV. It's got to be true. Well, maybe not. <laughs> but um, he, he got bogged down and kind of mistracked. But, you know, here's the message of the book of Revelation in a nutshell. Um, hang in there in your faith. Christ is coming soon. It'll be worth it. And the ending with the description of heaven, that's unequaled anywhere else in Scripture. Just beautiful stuff. In fact, throughout the book, we have little scenes that take place in the throne room of heaven. And every bit of it just, whew, I can't wait, I can't wait, I can't wait. It's something we look forward to. Um, so it's mainly about staying in the faith. Even though the persecution is real, um, troubles are real, uh, but it's worth it to stay in the faith. That's the message. And fascinating stuff in there. Um, I just ordered uh, a couple extra copies of a commentary in the book of Revelation. It was on clearance sale from CPH. For It's not my favorite one of the book of Revelations. It's the second favorite. But for $3, I thought, i got to get a couple of these. I can give them away. And so if you're ever interested, I, I'm, I'll have those somewhere next week probably. All right, questions you, that you have about the Bible. So, you know, for this class, one of the things I encourage you to do, I ask you to do, is just read your Bible. Read your Bible every day. You know, and I suggested you can start with the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, you know, but if you want to start somewhere else, I'm okay with that. The key is read it. I, I really want to suggest a couple of books in particular. When you're troubled, kind of going through struggles in life, I find the book of Psalms, there's 150 Psalms, most of them are relatively short, um, but I just start reading through there because um, David comes to uh, God with problems in a lot of them. And then by the end of that particular psalm, God's already changing him and you see the change. That's what I need sometimes. I need God to give me hope, and take away discouragement and fear. Okay, I'm going on memory. I should look this up. Here, let me, let me just look. Because uh, I was thinking it was somewhere either in the six to 800 range, but I don't have total confidence. I used to know all that when I uh, just got out of the seminary. Oh, yeah, I don't have my study Bible. Who's got a study Bible? You got a study Bible where they do the introduction to each of the books? Yours probably hasn't. But um, what year did it say it was written about? All right, so 400 to 500 years beforehand. And, uh, yeah, who, that, those predictions came true so exactly. And Isaiah has a bunch of them, yeah. So, um, but also um, the book of Proverbs, if you want, uh, you want to figure out how to, how to pursue a godly life, the book of Proverbs has 31 chapters. I find that interesting. So some uh, month with 31 days, just read one chapter of the book of Proverbs a day. Um, I, I started studying the book of Proverbs for a class I was teaching at, uh, where was it, at Bandy's. I used to go in there once a, quarter, once a semester and be a guest lecturer on their Bible as literature course, which I thought was fantastic because I'm getting to share a little bit of God's Word with people. And, you know, and I always startled them because I showed them the stuff on drunkenness and, you know, all the, <laughs> but, but I also was showing them Jesus, you know, but that's a powerful book if you just wander through it a little bit. So maybe some month just read one chapter a day and, you know, whoo, you know, <laughs> interesting stuff. All right, anything else? Because the choir is starting to come in and get robed up. All right, let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to study your word. Dear Lord, help us to know, just to know beyond a shadow of a doubt, to know through you, uh, your Holy Spirit who Jesus is, that he really is God and Savior, and what the Bible is, that it really is your powerful, saving word. Give us that kind of faith. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.